Welcome to Shortcast Over Coffee. Edmund Hillary once said, Mount Everest, you beat me the first time, but I'll beat you the next time because you have grown all you are going to grow, but I'm still growing. My guest today did exactly that to Mount Everest. Failed the first time, but scaled the second. He's the living, breathing, and walking example of the Gen Z term YOLO, you only live once. Ace mountaineer Satyarup Siddhanta holds the record of being the youngest in the world to have done the seven summits and the volcanic seven summits. Seven summits, which is climbing the seven highest mountains in each continent, has only been achieved by five Indians and by less than 500 people in the world so far. He has been delivering motivational talks about his life lessons from these summits at several renowned institutions and forums like the Indian Institute of Science Bangalore, IIT Kanpur, and TEDx. On to my conversation with Satya. Hello, Satya. Welcome to the podcast. Uh, thank you so much for giving me your time. I hear that you you had asthma growing up. Uh, how? When did you realize that you were different from other kids or what point did you realize that you needed an inhaler to go about your day-to-day lives? Actually, when I was in class two, uh, after the lunch break during the school time, like we call it Tiffin break. Uh, so uh, we used to play around uh, as, a, as a kid, like, you know, so we run around and stuff and all. So when I came back to class after the lunch break, um, I was having breathlessness. So the teachers uh, sent me back home. Uh, like you know so uh, and that day I was the happiest kid because I thought yeah the school got over <laughs> but only to realize that when I went back home there was no one to play with uh, because uh, everybody was in school uh, that time it was uh, I, I think I was too young to even understand uh, like you know that it can be an impediment or something like that but uh, what changed immediately was um, like you know over the course of time I was playing football with the kids. Then I saw that it was getting more difficult uh, to run. So I was going into the backy, then to goalkeeper and one fine day out of the football ground uh, as as a whole. But uh, uh, I didn't felt any deprivation as such because uh, I think uh, I found more options uh, apart from playing football and cricket. Uh, it was like, you know, uh, there were a lot of under construction houses that were uh, like going all around so our playground started becoming those places like you know so more of adventurous kind of exploration into those and then jumping from the parapets jumping from the cornices to the sand below who can jump from how far and who can climb the wall like <laughs> and climbing the trees and uh, dogs and cats and like you know so that became uh, our uh, entire playground so i didn't feel uh, left out or something because uh, you know as a kid uh, and it, I was never bullied also for uh, like, you know, having breathlessness and stuff. And also, I think uh, uh, that's how I grew up. And then I was in class three or four when I got my first inhaler. Uh, like, you know, so it was those uh, uh, before that, like, you know, I used to wake up in the night, uh, uh, sometimes breathlessness and all. We were, uh, I used to hear discussions about contemplation of uh, keeping an oxygen cylinder at home or something like that. But then these inhalers actually gave me uh, much relief. And then the bed bed got changed, then the, um, uh, the, the pillows got changed into like, you know, uh, some other material uh, than cotton uh, because it had a lot of uh, those allergens and uh, uh, dust allergies and stuffs and all. And was it called Astalin? Astalin, I think it was called. Yeah, 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 Astalin. <laughs> C plus Astalin inhaler, yeah. Right. Uh, so I used to take that and all. So, yeah, so that became my uh, company. And I would say till 2015, I was carrying it. I stopped using it um, in 2001. Like, you know, so what happened was I was in college and uh, uh, I studied from Sikkim, Manipal's uh, engineering college in Sikkim uh, so that time uh, even the, ge the geographic conditions and the environmental conditions around it it was like very moist and uh, ups and downs were there like you know so I mean like the entire uh, yeah, campus was, uh, yeah 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 near Gangtok so it's in uh, Rangpo so there uh, it used to get triggered more often and um, um, I used to have those inhalers almost uh, 
every day uh, and uh, then uh, one fine day i was going out uh, from the campus to the nearest locality uh, and uh, it was a saturday i still vividly remember so when i was going out of the campus uh, that time uh, i got this attack and uh, so i immediately reached out for my inhaler only to find out that that particular day i forgot my inhaler uh, uh, in the hostel room and uh, hostel room was a uh, little far uh, it was very difficult to go back and get that and also but the next uh, 10 minutes it became like you know so very uh, intense uh, moments of my life because uh, that 10 minutes i thought <laughs> i will die uh, and i was lying on the uh, road trying to breathe it's like you know, taking probably out probably the uh, first time you came face to face with death What yeah, I mean, it was like, uh, ha, I mean, uh, uh, the very feeling that I don't have the inhaler handy, and it was uh, getting like you know difficult to breathe, and uh, in the mountains, <laughs> like you know, it's a mountain zone actually. So I think uh, that uh, was very scary. It was like taking out a fish out of water, and I tried everything, like you know, trying to breathe faster to regularize, trying to hold the breath to regularize, but it was not stopping, and uh, but then after uh, 10 minutes or so slowly slowly it gradually it became okay but then i sat back i sat there in that circle and i was just uh, uh, like you know contemplating on that last 8 10 minutes and was uh, very angry on myself very like all the negative uh, emotions were coming up like you know uh, hatred and uh, anger and sulking and stuffs and all and uh, i i was 18 years that time so it was like my blood was boiling that why am i so dependent on this inhaler uh, can't i have a normal life uh, like you know um, and uh, then out of anger or whatever it is i <laughs> decided that see i didn't die uh, without inhaler so uh, yes it is difficult but i will not make myself uh, dependent on this inhaler and i don't want to give easy access to this inhaler uh, like you know uh, and uh, that day i decided that i am not going to carry the inhaler with me in my pocket anymore uh, and uh, from that again it spurred that i don't want to uh, even uh, miss i was allergic to a lot of food as well like you know so i had an allergy test before in kolkata that time so we were staying in a place uh, for 200 kilometers away from kolkata that time so i was uh, uh, diagnosed i mean i was uh, Uh, found to be allergic in egg in in brinjal in cauliflower cabbage you name it and I yeah life without brinjal for a bengali that must be hard because <laughs> you know i know and prawns and all and uh, the most importantly i was very fond of uh, these foods uh, and which i was not allowed to eat because if i had taken a bite it would create a spar like a hundred sneezes and uh, like you know it would get swelling and like you know it is to be and followed by uh, breathing problems as so uh, then i decided that i will eat everything <laughs> and, okay <laughs> and uh, uh, and i was ready for any consequences like you know so that kind of like frustrated like you know i was like so desperate to get rid of it or uh, whatever it is like you know i told like <laughs> no compromise anymore but then one side i promised this but then in reality what happened was uh, i stopped carrying the inhaler in the classroom suddenly i got attack and uh, uh i had to go back to my hostel room in the pretext of going to toilet and to just run from the administrative area from the that uh, education block to just opposite was the hostel so to run uh, like you know fanatically to go to my room open the lock and then take that inhaler uh, and it was like you know so since body was uh, getting deprived of it the reactions were more intense like you know so it was craving for those medicines uh, steroids right uh, but i was adamant not to carry it uh, in in my pocket i knew that it would be 10 15 minutes of uh, intense uh, situations but if i can uh, withstand that then uh, it will become normal <laughs> what what so, fascinates then... me is uh, you know having the presence of mind with those two incidents you know the incident in college where you were going out and that those 10 8 to 10 minutes where you did not have your inhaler and even this one where you had the presence of mind to go in in that kind of a situation i think 
you somehow knew that you were made for bigger things in life well that time uh, uh, if somebody would have told me that one day i'm going to climb mountains uh, or mount everest uh, or any hill also it would have been a very cruel joke on me <laughs> like you know so even i didn't believe that i can do all those things uh, right you know uh, but then uh, i also started going to uh, a nearby restaurant on saturdays uh, to order more of those mixed fried rice uh, such that i can get those prawns and uh, i used to keep two three anti allergic tablets uh, next to me so in the initial days immediately i used to take those uh, medicines and that effect was like uh, 10 15 minutes but after that it is to get okay i knew that i had the medicine right then slowly slowly i started um, putting a delay between uh, eating that and getting a reaction so i used to take that then i started delaying and then some days uh, i even got bolder and i tried to uh, see that how much can i withstand without taking the medicine and um, uh, then there came a point where some days i used to take the medicines some days i could go away without taking a medicine some day the reactions was a uh, little more some day it was little less so like that uh, then i realized much later that it was a kind of reconditioning of the body uh, uh, like you know so it's it's just about uh, like you know so um, uh, um, i think uh, there were some experimentations later which i read about uh, like you know how you can train your mind and uh, body and stuff and all so there are uh, but then yeah i i uh, when i look back it uh, find it is little fanciful means <laughs> probably i would not do those kind of uh, irresponsible things uh, but i think it is irresponsible but uh, then after four years i went to bangalore uh, and uh, in bangalore i heard like you know people who have allergies and all they suffer even more because of the pollen there uh in the in the in, in the water in the in the in the air and uh, but uh, fortunately i didn't had much attacks there but still the fear was i was carrying that you know what if something happens and then i had lot of friend circles uh, from the uh, hr uh, and most of them belong to the mangalore region uh, of india right and they were like uh, all uh, seafood eating people so any time i used to go to their house uh, for some uh, invitation uh, the only thing that was available was prawns and all so <laughs> uh, i used to take like you know i used to immediately map out that which are the nearby medicine shops in case something happens and i should be able to go within 2 kilometers and uh, get access to those medicines if something happens and all but this fear was uh, i was carrying and uh, in 2008 uh, one day when i was in office i came to office and i saw that my boss uh, he was seeing some pictures and uh, i asked what are these pictures and he said that uh, this weekend we went to a trek in tamil nadu uh, uh, to a place called parvat malai and i i was like it was so new for me because yeah, the irony is that even i stayed for four years in sikkim i never thought that there could be something called trekking and uh, things like that whereas it is a heaven for trekkers and stuff and all right but then uh, i saw the pictures and i was so fascinated seeing those pictures because uh, they were uh, walking in the jungle initially with those sticks and backpack and then uh, the last section was uh, a, a mountain a, a rocky section where there were like chains and ropes and ladders and they were holding it and it, it felt so adventurous because i was very fascinated with comics uh, like uh, phantom and uh, then some childhood novels uh, like you know which was more very adventurous kind of things uh, so immediately uh, something <laughs> resonated and uh, i also started feeling that urge to uh, go there and i asked him that do you think i, I can also go and uh, do this did he and, know uh, about your condition did he did no he no no i i was very uh, skeptical about letting anyone know in such in fact so even when people in in college they used to come to my room and see those inhalers they used to ask uh, who's is this and like we used to like look here and there and like you know <laughs> as if we don't know type it was like you know it's a very uh, inferiority complex there it was like you know to even let people know even when i used to take the inhalers i used to turn back and uh, uh, take the inhaler says that nobody can see and stuff and all you know so it uh, though nobody bullied me but still it was kind of um, uh, a mental agony i think uh, yeah deep inside so, you you probably wanted to be just as equal as anybody right yes 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 and uh, then uh, my boss who was like you know 
to two and a half times my size. Uh, so he told that if I could do, why can't you? And I think those were the magic words, but still I knew my conditions. Uh, so I knew my fears. So the next few days, uh, every time whenever I used to uh, say sleep got broken in the middle of the night, I used to think that I will go to those mountains one day. <laughs> Uh, should I go? Should I not go? But then, you know, the brain and mind, uh, the heart and brain uh, were playing different roles. The heart was saying that you should go. <laughs> uh, this is what you always uh, wanted to have some adventure in your life. And But the brain was telling that if you go, you will die a dog's death. <laughs> and it was true. Like, you know, so if somebody tells me today that, you know, I am asthmatic and I want to climb a mountain with you, I mean, like, I will uh, think Are you twice. Kidding me? twice uh, <laughs> yeah, I mean, like, so, I mean, <laughs> so, uh, but then suddenly one day I um, got this uh, realization that if I have an attack in the ground floor, my medicine is uh, that inhaler. And if I take a lift and go to a 15th floor, and if I have an attack, the medicine remains the same. So that means if I go to a mountain, which is like 200 floors, uh, then if I carry my inhaler, then I'll be fine, like, you know, so I'll not die. <laughs> so that gave me a lot of confidence and I bought immediately a new inhaler. And uh, then we organized a trek uh, to Parvat Malai, uh, keeping the same leader uh, as my boss. And I told that, please take us, please take us. And uh, I think that was very bold, one step forward. Uh, uh, I mean, and I really appreciate that I took that call to go to that mountain and uh we went to that mountain and in a hot summer april tamil nadu <laughs> okay and i can i can hour... totally imagine how that would have been <laughs> in one hour all the water got over like you know we were rookies like you know so and then uh, the local people were selling those uh goli soda uh, which typically in a normal day, I won't even touch thinking that I'll get cholera or something like that, typhoid. <laughs> and then, like, you know, I, we, that saved our life, like, you know, those and uh, uh, the buttermilk um, locally prepared. So uh, that way we went up to that hill and uh, I reached around uh, five-ish sometime at, that, uh, at the top of that hill. And it was so fascinating to be standing there and uh, looking down to see those roads through which we came up. It was like a small thin uh, line, like a kind of string, you know, and um, I couldn't believe. And I was like still sinking uh, into that reality that uh, that I have come all the way up. <laughs> and uh, while I was um, uh, enjoying uh, uh, that moment, like, you know, that moment of uh, reaching the first hill of your life. Uh, uh, suddenly I realized that uh, for not a single moment I had to use my inhaler and that moment I mean I I think that moment got frozen like you know that the thing and uh, I, I gave I got a freedom uh, sense of freedom like as if a thousand doves uh, were caged doves were given a uh, like you know uh, were uncaged and uh, and all the shackles were torn and like you know, and i felt like <laughs> and you know the situation was so filmy like you know at that moment the uh, uh, the temple uh, bells were chiming and the uh, flag was fluttering and i am standing there and uh, with that sense of uh, uh, like you know so everything became frozen into that moment and i think that moment i realized that that is the moment which uh, when i got a lot of self-esteem a lot of uh, confidence and i realized that i can do whatever i really want to do so that belief system got implanted and i think that day i climbed my mount everest and uh, and then <laughs> and then when i came back so in that moment i tried to understand that what do i want to do uh, and uh, thing was uh, I first thing came was that I want to do a horse riding because Phantom used to do horse riding. Like, you know? <laughs> and then I thought I, used to, I want to do paragliding. I want to do scuba diving. And eventually I did a certification in horse riding. I did a, a certification in paragliding. And oh uh, just God. last year I did a, a certification in scuba diving as well. Uh, yeah, I mean, like, I mean, I mean like, uh, so those were like all the uh, reasons why also I wanted at one point of time to join the Indian Air Force or Indian Army. I gave the exam also and cleared also, uh, but I didn't 
appear for the interview knowing that I'll be disqualified uh, because of my health reasons. Uh, uh, but then those uh, things which actually uh, was at attracting me to go for uh, the armed force actually i could relieve those without joining the armed force also so here also then i don't have any regrets uh, and uh, so then there was no looking back and i came back and when i was and one thing led to the other so uh, when i came back and and that time still mountaineering was uh, a foreign word for me uh, yeah. and uh, i didn't like if you had asked me what is the height of Mount Everest, I couldn't have told you. Like you know, <laughs> and uh, only the memories would have been in the children's book of knowledge that Tenzing Norgay holding uh, a kind of flag or something. <laughs> so that that was the only uh, uh, thing about Mount Everest. But then I came back and searched for horse riding uh, course and came across a website called Bangalore Mountaineering Club. And uh, while I was uh, exploring that website, I saw that there were a lot of weekend getaways uh, in and around Bangalore and it was very cheap like you know 400 rupees 500 rupees 300 rupees for a trek and uh, no logistic nightmares that you know <laughs> cab driver didn't come or one person cancelled. Was this mostly in in Kurg? Yeah it was in the Western Ghats the whole of Western Ghats uh, so uh, then uh, I again uh, accumulated all my courage and registered for one trek and uh, there I met so many people from different backgrounds uh, like a doctor, lawyer, uh, teacher, student, engineers, like you know you name it and every profession people you get and then slowly there becomes a community and uh, then I started going for treks. Almost every weekend I was the first person to register for whichever trek that weekend <laughs> was and uh, then uh, it went to an extent that uh, my tricks became free uh, in exchange of my uh, managing managing skills, uh, like you know. So then, um, so you would lead a pack them, of trackers, and then yes, 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 okay. yes. And then I, when I took assumed more responsibilities, uh, then they started paying me as a freelancer, and it was like, wow, you go for oh, a sweet Why mountain. Not? And <laughs> you get paid for that, like, you know, you get paid for getting a vacation kind of things and also it was like going on like that. And uh, only in 2010, December, uh, I went to Everest Base Camp. Uh, how did that happen? How did how did you move from a Bangalore? No, so Bangalore, it was going on. Uh, it was going on and all. Then one fine day I saw an advertisement um, of uh, uh, like, you know, uh, a trek to Everest Base Camp. And uh, to be honest, uh, I was going through some personal uh, problems, and uh, I just wanted to get to get go somewhere, like you know, just go <laughs> <laughs> and just go and like you know. And I saw that, and uh, but I saw the money; it was very costly even at that point of time. And then I sent an email that is there an installment uh, possible, and uh, then they said, okay, they will try because it was not organized by Bangalore Mountain Club, but they were just marketing it, so they got special permissions and. Uh, I was given an EMI option <laughs> and then oh, I wow. went uh, I went for that trick and uh, life changed again uh, after going there because uh, I think Everest Base Camp is a magical place uh, and uh, especially like you know and I had no clue where I was going as such I knew just I mean I didn't want to even check that which day where and all those things and all I knew what are the things required and how many days <laughs> that's it and like you know so uh, but then as I was going, I heard a lot of stories about uh, the disaster of 96. Then I got stories about uh, Mallory, uh, about uh, Tenzing, Hillary, and all those uh, mountain stories, like, you know, typically which you hear only on the mountains. And I got very fascinated. But at the same time, in the first day, I was thinking, why this madness about uh, Everest so much? Like, you know, so everywhere you go in Nepal, Kathmandu, it was like mountain shops are like, uh, Himalayan saloon, <laughs> you, are, you go and say uh, Everest meat shop, <laughs> Everest cafe. And I was thinking, uh, what is so big deal about this and all? And I had no clue that uh, mountaineering is a different ball game than trekking. And uh, uh, but on the second day when I saw Mount Everest in front of me yeah, while in the trek, I was blown out. Like, you know, it was amazingly beautiful. And during December, you don't have any clouds. And it was like, you know, the whole... Everest was in front of you from far below and uh, the uh, like you know plumes snow plumes were like you know moving out like a volcano from the top and 
uh, it was so fascinating. I think uh, Everest put a spell on me. It casted a spell on me and uh, uh, I promised Everest that I'm going to come back without knowing the facts and figures. I didn't even think that um, it was uh, uh, so dangerous or <laughs> so costly an affair uh, and it requires a different skill set altogether. It's not. I thought it was just yet another walking peak or something like that. But then uh, <laughs> the whole trick uh, till the base camp and come back, it was Everest in my mind. Like, you know, so every breath I was breathing Everest and stuffs and all. But then when I came back, uh, I searched for, um, like, you know, uh, I, 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 what I does bought it take to, what yeah, does I it bought take some to book. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I bought a book uh, called Into Thin Air by John Crocker. And uh, based on which the Everest movie uh, happened, that is on the 1996 disaster. And then I bought a book on Paths of Glory on George Mallory's. Uh, uh, like you know life it is uh, by Jeffrey Archer and uh, the first book I read happened to be the Into Thin Air and uh, I was shocked hearing uh, reading that book because uh, for the first time not only did I realize uh, what does it take to climb Mount Everest but then it also showed the very dark side of Everest uh, like you know so many deaths and uh, so many uh, like you know unskilled people going to the mountains and uh, like you know so the commercialization of Everest and all all those things were there and it didn't put a ro rosy picture in front of me and I am so grateful that I uh, took that book as my first book because uh, it made me think that what I should do and what I should not and on the mountains uh, and then I realized that I cannot just go to, even if I have all the money in the world, I cannot go to Mount Everest unless I am skilled uh, or I am trained. So then I realized that I have to go for a training, formal training. And I went and registered for uh, Himalayan Monitoring Institute, Darjeeling uh, in 2011, December. Right. And all but, this while you did have a full-time software job. Oh, yeah, yeah. And then I was thinking that how on earth will I get one month leave? right and it was not possible to get a one month leave and uh, i to to leave a job at that moment was also uh, like you know so people don't appreciate uh, breaks in your career uh, so then it was uh, very dicey but then uh, i started thinking that what should i do to ensure that the company will give or who should i become such that company can give me one month leave then first thing was thinking that okay if i become a ceo <laughs> but then i realized that uh, being a ceo you will not even get one day holiday because <laughs> you have to uh, get busy with the work and all and i think that's the time when i stopped climbing the corporate ladder and uh, i decided that i don't want to climb that ladder because that will only make me busy and i will not be able to go to mountains then i thought uh, if I become the most uh, talented employee of the company, the most uh, useful resource of the company, then probably uh, they will not want to let go of the best resource. And I aim to become the best resource of the company. And I started working very hard. I used to go to office at 5.30 in the morning and come back at 10.30 in the night, finish off all the projects one by one, like in you know, multiple projects, executing this and that grabbed all the awards <laughs> to that extent of getting the uh, best award all over the world like you know so they have excellent precedence excellence award and all those things and all and every time i used to get those pat on the backs or those awards i used to let my bosses know that uh, i would require some leave <laughs> and they used to ask uh, when and i used to like in december for one month and they used to get scared like you know shocked but at that moment when they were in their happy moment and they were appreciating me, I knew that those were the times that I had to hit. <laughs> and uh, uh, eventually I got one month leave and I still remember I, after when, so in the mountain course, typically there are three segments. Like one is the rock climbing section, which is like typically you do it in, while you are in, in Darjeeling itself, like, you know, uh, in the Institute itself. And then you go to the mountains to do the snow craft and ice craft. Like, you know, so snow craft is all the training related to mountains where there are a lot of snow. And uh, ice craft is the place where typically when you walk on the blue ice and the equipments are different and uh, the way you walk are different and stuff. And all right. So when I was in HMI's uh, rock climbing part, like, you know, which in, in the campus, 
So every day after the whole workout and all the trainings and all, I used to open <laughs> a dongle and my laptop and <laughs> start working and finish off my work and then uh, go ahead. Because but then I realized that I I didn't feel that as uh, a big problem because I knew that that was uh, an opportunity for me to uh, do what I want to do if I can manage both. Like and. Uh, uh, I didn't uh, feel bad about working late nights, <laughs> finishing my things and all. But yeah, eventually I did my course and then I realized that uh, just doing the course won't uh, let me go to the Mount Everest. I have to gain experience also. And uh, uh, and regarding money, I thought was thinking that it's impossible to have a dream of climbing Mount Everest was Ethiopian because uh, that much when I read that book, it demanded 36 lakhs to climb Mount Everest and I was calculating how many months, how many years I have to work without touching my salary to get that much money. And that amount was uh, very big, like and it was a very demotivating number. And uh, I was almost about to give up on the dreams uh, of climbing Everest, thinking that it's an impossible dream. But then I got so much attached to that dream, uh, like, you know, it became a part of me and I didn't want it to slip it off and uh, to let it go because it was as if like letting it go means letting a part of me go. <laughs> and then I started thinking that what can I do uh, to make sure that I can earn that much money. And uh, the first thing was let's loot a bank. <laughs> <laughs> and then I realized that that won't help because uh, then I'll be climbing the I'll be aiming to climb the walls of the jail <laughs> rather than <laughs> climbing the walls of the mountains. But then I realized that uh, so that time, you know, the Konbanega Karopati that that was uh, going on yeah. pretty famous. And uh, uh, so and they were calling common people. And uh, I started thinking that what if I, uh, what if I get called there? Right. And uh, then I started <laughs> laughing at my own thought that why on earth Amitabh Bachchan will call me for that <laughs> show. Uh, but then again, uh, one part of me started justifying that why not? Uh, what is the probability that I'll get called? So thanks to my engineering background, like, you know, some of the probabilistic <laughs> things came into picture. And then I tried to figure out Yes, the probability is very less, like 0. 0. 0. 0. 0. 0. 0. 0. 0.00000001 probably uh, percentage, but uh, then that is not equal to zero. And uh, so I still have a chance. <laughs> and with that 0. 0. 0. 0. 0. 0.00001 percent hope, I clung to it and ignored the point and ignored the 99.9999 percentage of not getting call. Uh, but uh, that hope gave me think that, okay, that money is now sorted out. Like, you know, so, uh, and I always knew that uh, I should be prepared uh and it should not happen that opportunity goes in front of me and i'm not able to uh like you know pounce on it just because i'm not prepared so uh so i believe that opportunity comes to every individual with equal probability it's just the one who is prepared can grab it uh, so i thought let me prepare myself with all the experience and uh with all the um, what do you call with all the skills and everything so then i finished my hmi course and then I realized that I have to. So I was carrying my inhaler again. So in Everest Base Camp also, I carried the inhaler uh, because um, uh, I was told that you don't know what is going to happen at high altitude. Uh, so better keep it. But I was carrying this fear. I carried that in uh, 2011 HMI course also. Uh, but I didn't have to use, but still it was a kind of safety net <laughs> in my bag. And uh, then I started Just searching to... for... Just huh. to double click on the HMI course, uh, just for the sake of the audience, if if an average person wants to uh, climb Mount Everest, he needs to undergo a one month course with HMI. So not Everest alone. If, if he wants to go to any mountain, uh, which is a serious mountain, like you know, which is above the, um, which is called a high altitude, right? Like anything above 12,000 feet to 14,000 feet, anything above that is termed as high altitude uh, mountains. And if it requires uh, anything apart from walking, right, uh, which requires the aid of any tools like ropes or crampons or shoes and stuffs and all, uh, then this course is a must, right? So this course prepares you to climb mountains anywhere in the world 
uh, it will give you that basic uh, training and understanding the skills to climb any mountain. And then there are advanced mountaineering courses also, uh, which will allow you to prepare for uh, an organized expeditions and even taking tougher mountains and stuff. So now. And then there are some other courses like uh, if somebody wants to go in a direction of uh, a teacher, mountain uh, trainer, so there is a method of instruction course, MOI course. And then uh, if somebody wants to get into the disaster management kind of role, so there is something called search and rescue uh, course. Like, you know, so these all are of typically one month duration courses yeah. in India. And most of the these courses typically should be very costly, but Indian government, uh, they put a lot of money uh, to uh, like, you know, um, to ensure the promotion of this so people have to pay um, like very less like i think uh, very less compared to actual cost so now right. it is 26000 when we did it was 4000 something uh, so 26000 and uh, you can uh, you need to be fit to run for 5 kilometers uh, that's the basic fitness that is uh, getting like it is demanding uh, but yes it is uh, like if somebody doesn't want to pursue mountaineering I, I would ask that they should still go and do this course because it's a like it teaches you a lot of things of life skills and discipline and everything like you know so it will no matter which profession you go uh, it will help you that that mountaineering course if you get the time of course like you know that is something the most uh, costliest commod commodity now that the time <laughs> people don't have the time but absolutely yeah. so yeah yeah so you were but still then, carrying your inhaler yeah, and I was you were, carrying you were my trying to and figure out how how to sort of accumulate no it was just like you know i figured out that okay it is not going to come between me and mountains but still like the fear was there like what if it comes and like you know so what if what if uh but then i came back and i realized that after getting to understand the um mountains i realized that our human body needs to uh get accustomed to altitude and uh, the experience comes from altitude as well as from uh, tough mountains so i chose kilimanjaro as my next mountain uh, because one was that in my childhood novels those uh, uh, africa was very fascinating and um, uh, to be able to go to africa i think uh, in our generation at least in our place everybody had a shared interest of uh, going to africa <laughs> and uh, uh, so, and I realized that Kilimanjaro was a mountain which will give me the experience of an altitude, but it doesn't demand technicalities. So I thought, let me take one at a time skill set, like, you know, so while I was searching for Kilimanjaro, I realized uh, and I came across that uh, Kilimanjaro is a part of uh, seven summits. And uh, I was uh, like, you know, uh, I was uh, curious that what is this seven summits? Uh, so in Wikipedia, I clicked and uh, and suddenly I got to know that, oh, Seven Summits is climbing the highest mountains of all the seven continents. Did I hear it right? Like seven continents, that means Antarctica also has a mountain. Because <laughs> typically we used to think that Antarctica is like little small thing below art in the globe and never ventured out to see what is there and all right, you know, except that there is South Pole. And I, I never thought then that there could be anything more than south pole <laughs> in antarctica but then i realized after going to antarctica twice i realized that this place is a magical place this place is a uh, huge <laughs> antarctica is a big continent and has a lot of things to offer but yeah i mean like then um, i actually went around to see and click all the seven continents and see which is the highest mountains and i started reading about that and uh, in uh, mentally i prepared that okay this year i am going to do this then next year this 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 and uh, no no next year let me do this and then this and like you know and suddenly i came back to reality and i was thinking that i don't have money to climb one mountain and here i'm talking about seven mountains <laughs> and then i realized that it's just like um infinity you know so you add anything to infinity is still infinity you multiply anything to infinity is infinity so Everest was like infinity for me and uh, like, you know, so because that much money, uh, that mental block itself was a huge Everest in front of, I think, many Everest aspirants. Um, so that how will I arrange that much money? Like, you know, so then I realized that if Everest was infinity, add 
another seven mountains to it how does it matter it's like if i can dream of climb going to mars why not pluto <laughs> why not another solar system like you know so so then i thought let me dream uh, and i allowed myself to dream uh, and uh, um, i still remember I was even scared to tell about this dream to people that people will laugh at it, like you know that <laughs> climbing. I I first told to one of my boss in Korea, and uh, he told, "Oh, Sati, uh, you need to change your dream to become a CEO. <laughs> you need to. Uh, this is so dangerous." And uh, then one day I actually wrote it down, like you know, and it was this uh, a course for seven. Uh, effect, uh, effective habits of uh, uh, highly effective people. Some one one course was there, and uh, uh, when I went for that course, so they asked to write the dreams and all, and I was getting so much resistance to write that, and uh, finally, I just wrote, and I think that time, first time I saw it in front of my eyes that this is my dream of climbing the seven summits. And uh, I got the confidence to talk about it. That yes, I'm going to do that. And uh, I was not sure how, but something was telling me that even I get into this journey, and doesn't matter what till how much I reach, it's about this journey. And even if I stop at third and try for the fourth and not able to, but at least I tried following my dreams. Right. And uh, so I just jumped into that and then after finishing Kilimanjaro then I finished Elbrus uh, so I took a group of 12 people to Kilimanjaro I led that team then I went to Elbrus again led another 13 people and then uh, uh, went to Aconcagua so a lot of adventures misadventures on in all these expeditions uh, sometimes uh, expedition got in Aconcagua expedition got cancelled and I signed an indemnity bond and I went alone again to climb that mountain. Oh my uh, God. Like, you know, so a uh, lot of loans, a lot of parallel loans. Then 2015, then I went to Denali and uh, Denali was that time my um, the most uh, memorable and difficult mountain for me. And uh, we did unsupported and unguided, uh, no Sherpa, no expert, no agency. We were five friends and uh, uh, we just went to that mountain, not to prove our bravado, but we didn't have money uh, to climb. What about uh, tools? Tools and all, we bought it. Uh, we, did, uh, we, we didn't compromise on the tools, but uh, we didn't have money to uh, get it organized through an agency because it would have costed eight to 10 lakh rupees. And uh, after Aconcagua, I was almost broke after taking a lot of loans again. And thanks to banks that uh, they gave me personal loans, <laughs> not for climbing mountain, but uh, I had to show that uh, some house repair, those bank agencies, they used to take care of that. But uh, I know that it is a little unethical, but then that time I needed money uh, and uh, I I didn't bother to know that why and what reasons they were putting. And <laughs> But I, uh, I, I think without these loans it was impossible for me to uh, even uh, go for these mountains because there was so, no government support or no sponsors and stuffs and all uh, so between, back in those days wasn't uh, crowd support or crowdfunding a thing no crowdfunding i started for everest so what happened was in 2015 i decided 2014 after mobla i climbed mobla uh, and then i decided that let me go for everest but then where do i start where do i get the money so suddenly one of my ex boss from my uh, uh, previous office uh, he called out of nowhere after two three years uh, and uh, i just shared that i was planning to climb everest but uh, looking so he suddenly told that he wants to support the expedition and i was like no 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 like how do i take that and stuff but then he insisted and he promised a thousand dollars funding towards that and eventually he gave two thousand dollars and i i thought that it was a mistake that double transaction happened again i called him up in the us and he said no 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 uh, suddenly i got money from somewhere else and i thought this was meant for you and uh, so that was intentionally put 2000 dollars so i thanked him and put a post about how i met him and uh, uh, like how, what does he mean to me in in my thing and all and i put a family picture and put it in facebook and suddenly it opened up a Pandora's box, like, you know, people all around, they started saying that we want to support you. We want to support wow. you. And I and uh, I was not comfortable taking money from people like that. And uh, right. but then I started putting for every donation that came, I put it there, like how I met them or 
what they are and like you know so it's all in my facebook <laughs> 2015's timeline you will get to see so that way i raised 6 lakh rupees uh, from crowdfunding so uh, crowdfunding just happened by chance like you didn't yeah by know. chance yeah yeah wow and uh, my college manipal group uh, so it was a funny incident i went to uh, so initially i thought i i'll go to manipal group chairman dr pai and i will ask for sponsorship for a mountain in australia it was like uh, it would have costed 1 lakh rupees because of the flight tickets and all and it's a very easy mountain actually like if a 5 year old guy can climb that mountain like it's a <laughs> 2 hours thing uh, with steps like you know so it's a very small height uh, thing so uh, even we took our friend uh, who came to drop us uh, he came from office with his suit uh, so i took him up also to the mountain <laughs> so he probably was the first person to climb in suit <laughs> so that uh, i meant to say that this is the it happened to be the most easiest uh, hike two hours hike kind of things and all right so well while i was waiting for dr pai uh, uh, in the reception suddenly it occurred to me that i will get kicked out <laughs> Uh, anyways, so later on, if he goes and search about that mountain, uh, he will feel uh, so ridiculous that I came for a mountain like that. Uh, then sitting there, I decided I changed my strategy and I told that, okay, let me ask for, let me get kicked out for a big mountain like Everest rather than um, cause you. Why not? Hey. And I just went and uh, pitched for Everest and... Uh, it was so funny and uh, so obviously he didn't knew that how much it costed and also he asked me that uh, how much uh, does it cost to climb uh, i told thirty thousand dollars and that time uh, the cost we got after cutting everything off like you know all luxuries out we could manage with uh, that time 60 rupees was a dollar price it was like 18 lakh rupees it would have required for climbing mount everest so i took thirty thousand dollars and uh, he was shocked and he said that what $30,000. And I told that, if you don't believe, go and check. <laughs> I mean, like, because I felt it very personally that, like, you know, that he's not believing my words. Like, you know, so I'm like, that is the cost. What can I do? And then he suddenly said, okay, I'll give you. Uh, and I was expecting that he will kick me out. Like, you know, he'll say, get out or something like that. And I was like, expecting that. And suddenly he told that, okay, I'll give you $10,000. And I, I didn't register. And I was like, what did I hear? Like ten thousand dollars, and I was calculating like how much is ten thousand dollars. And I was saying, uh, you are not happy. Uh, what, what what was the number in your mind? Like how much you thought you will get? And I said, no, no, no. I was like so overwhelmed uh, to like you know. Uh, the, I'm really thankful and uh, thanks for everything and all. And uh, I was so grateful to in Manipal because they didn't had any demand that in return you have to do this, you have to do that, and all stuff and all. He just said that don't die, <laughs> and, <laughs> and uh, then I came out with mixed feelings. One side, and this time uh, here I didn't had a um, crowdfunding started till then. So here I have with six lakh rupees, and I have no clue how will I arrange the rest twelve lakh rupees. I don't know. So it was, and I cannot go back also telling that no, 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 I don't want to climb Everest. Like take back this money. So at this point, uh, this happened and crowdfunding happened and then there is six lakh rupees. Uh, so I was all my all my uh, salary was going for paying the previous loans and um, my parents and brother came forward and uh, they pitched in uh, with their savings uh, another six lakhs. And uh, now I was almost ready and we were going for Everest Base Camp uh, on the same route and then climb Everest uh, like in 2015. So it was like uh, life was unfolding and I couldn't believe that the dream was coming true. Like in a dream I dreamt in 2010, uh, in five years, uh, I'm giving a shape to that dream. Uh, thanks to all the people. And as we were moving inch by inch uh, towards the base camp and uh, uh, we were having uh, a break in Gorak ship, the last settlement. And uh, suddenly uh, the ground shook, the wow. big earthquake happened in 2015 in nepal the most disastrous earthquake ever that happened in nepal 10000 people died uh, unofficially it's even more number and uh, the, there was a huge avalanche that got triggered just after that a part of which came to gorakhshep as well and uh, 21 climbers uh, and supporting staffs died in base camp 
and uh, after this disaster the expedition got cancelled in a second uh, all 18 lakhs vanished <laughs> oh my god <laughs> i mean just hearing you speak i feel yes. like the the entire event is sort of unfolding in front of my eyes that that must have been devastating i mean you were like what 75% of the way till everest or yeah we're just base camp like you know so we're just reaching base camp from there now the climb starts oh, okay actually. okay so not even reaching base camp like it was like we were supposed to reach base camp three days before but we deviated and went and climbed another mountain to acclimatize oh so uh, just this was just before the base camp okay yes 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 and uh i couldn't accept the fact that the expedition is over and that the money is lost and that money is not my money alone like you know so it was people's money and what will i tell what will i go back and how will I pay back Manipal? How will I pay back these people? Like, you know, so it was like very devastating time. And uh, the next day we went to base camp again to see, and we saw that dead bodies were lying around in, wrapped in plastic, uh, blood and broken tents, broken laptops, broken shoes, like shoes here, there, everywhere. Like it's a devastating uh, thing that had happened there. And, uh, but I was so insensitive to the whole situation and uh, it was more of, what happens to my expedition what happens to my money and like you know and i was like trying to figure out is there no way that i can go to the camp two by helicopter and then we open the route and go like you know still trying to figure out you are crazy <laughs> <laughs> yeah but uh then while i was loitering around and nobody could give an answer to me that and i was thinking that can i go to any other mountain with this money it means it's like right, right, right. Money, it's like you know it's very difficult to accept it and uh, that acceptance yeah. is something probably mount everest wanted me to teach <laughs> to get taught like you know so uh, then suddenly when i was roaming around i came across a book it was lying like as if somebody threw that book and uh, so i was uh, very curious to see that what is that what is that book and i came near to that book and i did the title of the book and it was a slap on my face i know the title of the book was dead or alive question mark and i took a picture of that book as well and for a moment i froze and uh, i realized that i don't even know the person who was reading that book was dead or alive and then i got the realization that i could have been dead in this right the the greatest gift is that i am still alive i lost today all the money i lost the opportunity but what i didn't lose is the hope right so if I can have the candle of hope burning, then I know that if not tomorrow, if not day after tomorrow, maybe after 10 years, maybe after 20 years, I'll accumulate again that money and I'll come back. But only if I'm alive, right? And then I suddenly felt a deep gratitude uh, for the very fact that I'm still alive. And uh, everything shifted, like, you know, and all those turbulence just calmed down and... Uh, I brought back all the broken dreams, which were like, you know, strangled and broken into million pieces. I brought, brought back all those. And again, in the hope that I can, I can put it back with the glue of hope. And uh, I came back and um, uh, by the time I left my job, uh, because I was not getting the leave. <laughs> and um, I was told that either I choose Everest or the job and uh, uh, all my plans were converging to Everest and there was no more plan beyond Everest. And uh, so I, I realized that let me come back alive and then we'll plan my next part of my life uh, depending on the outcome. So I didn't really bother whether my job will go or not. So I decided to uh, quit. And uh, uh, but financial burden was there still, a lot of uh, things. So I couldn't even leave totally. But then the company was uh, uh, very accommodative. They told that you can always become a consultant and uh, work. And I became a consultant from the very next day I left my job. <laughs> and um, uh, that gave me more flexibility. Uh, and uh, But then after I came, I came back, I was like, um, I didn't know what where life is taking me and <laughs> what will I do. And uh, then... I went to Australia, finished this mountain, and then prepared, kept myself prepared in a hope for a miracle. And then miracle really happened in 2016 
in around February, suddenly we got to know that uh, Nepal government is waiving off $10,000 permit fee, 11,000 permit fee. Uh, so we don't need to pay that much money. So that suddenly rekindled our hope. But then I, I knew that people were already invested on uh, me and I didn't want it to create another uh, uh, crowdfunding because the same people would have given double double thing without an ROI, right? You know, so no return on investment. So I didn't approach any companies also because uh, a fear was going on that what if again another disaster happens because then I realized that it is very unpredictable uh, and a lot of uncertainties are around it, right? And uh, but then again, my brother and my parents came forward and they almost gave their everything uh, to fund this expedition. Uh, and uh, it was a big risk. Um, looking back, I feel that it was uh, it was <laughs> probably I could have waited another year to uh, like you know um, settle a little better or something like that. But then I was not sure that if it it would be the next year I will get that same wave of of that money or not. Uh, so 2015 I carried the inhaler with me, but then 2016 when I was packing my bag, my dad asked. He's a doctor, so he asked, "Are you carrying the inhaler?" I told yes. But I was not <laughs> because this time something changed in me and I thought that uh, what am I fearing of when there are more bigger things to fear and I had no control on the sphere uh, and anything can happen. Then this is like, why am I carrying the fear with me? Because in all forums, I'm telling that I recovered from asthma yet I'm carrying my uh, inhaler. So it was a little dichotomy for me. So then I decided to get rid of that, uh, that fear. So I went to Everest without <laughs> the inhaler. And uh, then a lot of thing happened in this expedition. Uh, so um, I saw a Sherpa falling off in front of me and uh, he just slid to his death. And uh, it shook me a lot and I was uh, so scared. Uh, when I was closing the eyes, I was seeing uh, and brain was also making some changes in those uh, visuals and things like that. And it became like, you know, so it added and manipulated that picture and I was hearing sounds and uh, visuals and things like that and especially in the high altitude this affects you a lot uh, when you go like you know so uh, but then um, these do you are think all mountaineering options. just as much as it is a test of physical endurance do you think a mental oh, it is, balance um, more of, uh, see it is taken that when you are going to a mountain you will be fit right that is taken but then a lot has to happen on your mind uh, like you know it's a test of your mental fitness your mental stability and when things which will derail you destabilize you what is your power to bring back your brain to again normal functioning like you know so when you see that like in front of you uh, a person who was alive just one minute back and he just fell off and he happened to be the best uh, the most technical technically sound person sherpa uh, of the whole region and because of a small mistake uh, like you know he fell off uh, right you know so those uh, even then I fell in a crevice and I was hanging for half an hour uh, waiting for someone to spot me <laughs> and then my friends came and uh, I could hear their footsteps and I could ask them to uh, like you know uh, pull me out and like, you know, so there were a lot of those kind of things and all and then when I was uh, reaching after all these when I was uh, when I just reached the top of South Summit, the one that you typically see as summit is not the actual summit, so it's the South Summit. So from there you have to actually go through that big ridge, uh, and then cross that Hillary Step area and uh, reach the summit. So while I was sitting there, uh, we reached pretty early, and uh, suddenly my left eye went blind, and oh. uh, I was so scared because. Uh, Typically, you get snow blind uh, when uh, sun comes out and you don't have a glass. But that time it was moonlight and I didn't know that what exactly happened. But uh, much later, I realized that it could be because of a internal hemorrhage or a pressure difference or the temperature difference. Like it was so cold, uh, probably the refractive index of the eye got changed or something. But it just became shut. Like shut meant I couldn't see anything on the left eye. And immediately in the night, I took on the glasses uh, and I couldn't even see now with the right eye also. And like then people just crossed me. And uh, now at this moment, when my team, um, another team member, Mala Mukherjee, so he came and he saw me that I was sitting there. So he asked, uh, what happened? Then I told that this has happened. Let's go together. And then 
just as I was waiting for uh, my turn to walk on that uh, ridge, suddenly I felt that my oxygen uh, is not coming in my mask. And I thought maybe the oxygen knob got closed somehow. Then I just asked my person there that, can you see that uh, is oxygen over or is it is the knob got closed? So he checked and he said the oxygen is there and the knob is also open. And by the time there were people waiting behind me, so they were all saying that move, move, move. And like, you know, so I had to actually start moving and trying to figure out that uh, the mask is not working, why it is not working. So standing at 8,800 uh, meters and um, there is no oxygen, like supplemental oxygen. And uh, I'm just trying to uh, feel. So actually in the pipe somewhere, so typically this oxygen gets filled up um, with uh, locally, like you know, they get filled up locally. So there are a lot of water vapors might have entered into the oxygen. And so when it was coming out from this pipe somewhere, that water vapor uh, froze and became ice and it was blocking the oxygen to come to Did my. Did you try to uh, use someone else's oxygen cylinder at the time? Who, 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 no, oxygen, I have full cylinder. It's the mask. So who will carry an extra mask? Nobody carries an extra mask, right? Right. And uh, I was trying to figure out where this blockage is. And again, at the same point of time, you have to walk. And for half an hour, I walked like that. And uh, suddenly, I was feeling these cramps because uh, supplemental oxygen. Now, people can go to Mount Everest without oxygen also. But then they don't use oxygen before and suddenly stop. Like, you know, so you have to acclimatize your body without oxygen. You go up and come down and you practice that way such that you don't need your oxygen requirement is less. But here, I was having oxygen all the way. And suddenly the oxygen stops so your acclimatization is also down because uh you are taking oxygen right you know and suddenly so it creates a big impact and uh, i was uh, uh at one point of time i realized that if i go further i'll get a cramp and uh, uh, i will not be able to recover from that cramp because i had to prevent the cramp from happening and uh, then i clamped at one place and i just stood waiting for my uh, other partner because in between there were so many people who just got in like you know so they were going one by one crossing me and uh, at one point of time I, I started uh, like you know requesting people that can you please call that guy because I was not able to call him like you know and those guys thought that I'm dying and they were just uh, drawing a cross in their thing and oh. saying a silent prayer and moving away from me and I was like and I couldn't explain them no 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 I'm not dying <laughs> But like, you know, so, but it was a uh, hard reality. Like, you know, when, when you see people's in people's eye, they are thinking that you are dying and uh, you also feel that, is it really like, am I dying? <laughs> and like, you know, so when my, uh, and all this while I was not taking the help of my uh, Sherpa company and uh, because uh, we were very well acclimatized and we were uh, able to do it all by ourselves. So my Sherpa company and he went, to the summit and was waiting for us and suddenly he says that we are not coming so he came back and says why are you still standing here like you know <laughs> it's just 10 minutes uh, come come and i told that my oxygen is not working and he came and he checked the pressure and all everything he saw that everything is fine and he thought that my brain is gone like you know typically at high altitude it happens like you know you you get disoriented and um and before i explained him anything he again went away like you know telling that come <laughs> and then uh, another friend, the other friend and his shape of companion came and I asked him that, uh, see, my mask is not working. Is this happened? And he told that, see, I know only to put it on and take it off. <laughs> I don't know the mechanism. And then he asked that, uh, now what to do? And I asked him that, can I take your, oh, can I borrow your mask for some time? And uh, he said, sir, if I give my mask, I'll die. Right. And it's such an intense situation that, you know, you know that this is the reality, like um, he cannot, he, though he, you have hired him as a Sherpa, he, it is, doesn't mean that yeah, he is bound to give his thing at the cost of his life to save yours and stuff, so, right? And uh, I was not sure what to do now because uh, it was quite evident and written in the world that it's over, right? You know, <laughs> And uh, that kind of time. Suddenly, out of nowhere, my friend, he told uh, that, you know what, we have enough oxygen. Let us share the mask and go, like, you know, so we can walk side by side and when we need, let's do it. 
and i was shocked seeing um, i mean i mean having that presence of mind and compassion at that sort of a scenario exactly. i mean that is exactly. unbelievable and no one no one gives their mask no one no matter how big a mountaineer you are and stuff so no, because yeah, even, you know that even, you are giving even you are flying an airplane mind. you are like yeah. put on your mask before you put it yeah. on on the other person right so yeah. like, and i was shocked and i was just looking at him and the faith on humanity was restored somehow I means mean, like <laughs> it's yeah. got like i mean like how how is how, means it was totally like am i hearing it correctly like you know so that kind of thing while he was taking out his mask again my sherpa friend um, uh, person he came and he was again shouting at me that you are still standing here and then i told okay boss you don't believe that my mask is not working why don't you try it out now he realized the gravity of it and uh, then he says uh, now what do you suggest i told look if i given a chance to die i will rather die submitting than before submit right because if that is the only choice i have so you give me your mask for 10 minutes right so i am a person from the plains and it's a fact that last 30 minutes i am without supplemental oxygen and i didn't die yet right so you are a person from the mountains so i can guarantee you that you will not die in 10 minutes right so uh, you can survive if i can survive half an hour you can survive 10 minutes for sure and you are from this mountain like this so you give me your mask and i promise you to give it back after reaching the summit but he was a little skeptical that what if i don't give back and all then i assured him that see you are so many brothers sherpa brothers are there fight it out i cannot fight all of you together right if i don't give you back but i need it and he thought for a moment and he gave his mask to me and i just took that mask and put it i felt all the energy in my body because after so many time because at that high altitude typically the oxygen saturation is like you know half a one third of what you get here and that is not enough to uh, like you know have a clear thought process or muscles or the organs uh, or the heart to pump properly so when i got that i felt a like you know big pound of energy and i started running <laughs> overtaking people like you know because i i know that i have to give back this mask let me just finish it off fast and i just <laughs> went to the top and when i reached the top suddenly i realized that oh, i am at the top <laughs> and i could see the final point and there were some flags there and how long uh, how long do you get to spend at the top of the everest you, typically typically people don't stay more than 10 minutes but i had to spend almost like 45 minutes because i'll tell you why and <laughs> when i reached <laughs> there uh, typically i was looking around and it was so Uh, heavenly but suddenly i used to think no 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 i have to take the picture and go down fast otherwise i'll die like you know so i have to finish off fast so i just went hurriedly and sat on the top of the world the last portion and it felt like wow i'm really at the top of the world nice <laughs> then suddenly like i got let me take out my camera and uh handicam and take a like you know what i thought that i will tell at the top of everest and thanking my sponsors and these and that so i took my handicam and suddenly i switched on and i was almost about to tell i am at the top of that i suddenly see like tink 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 the battery from full it becomes zero but because it was so windy and cold and uh, a cold wave uh, passed through my spine and i was like thinking shit the <laughs> camera went for a toss then uh, i thought i patted my back that i have a backup i knew that this can happen i have another camera at my in my bag then i took out the camera and i thought okay let me just keep it short take this and just get off from here and i took out that the lens came out and went inside this camera also became dead <laughs> now i got even scared but then i had a backup of this backup i had extra batteries uh, covered in a socks uh, in my bag so i took out that but only to realize that to put that battery i need to open my gloves because it was a very small nikon a small camera so now at that altitude if i open my gloves i will lose my fingers and and i have no other thing to do and i could see the sherpa and my friend is coming he will take away my mask so uh, i did a dry run like you know okay how fast i can do <laughs> open that and open the gloves and like again put it back so i did two three dry runs now like okay <laughs> i just took off my 
uh, jackets uh, chain little bit put that uh, big gloves because i had an experience of my gloves flying off and i had three uh, frostbitten fingers uh, in the initial level in denali so i was very careful with the gloves so then immediately i took off the gloves <laughs> replaced the batteries and again put the gloves and i was like i hope my fingers i don't lose my fingers and then i opened i switched on the camera and again it got switched off so this also drained off now i'm sitting there and suddenly i see my friend coming and i was calling him like i know the audience will not be able to see me but i literally have had my hand on my face for the last 20 minutes this this is (laughs) insane go on then i asked him okay uh get me uh I, I was calling him that come come fast and he was like taking one one step and enjoying the beauty here and there and then taking one more step and I, I couldn't wait for long. I just ran towards him again and I told, uh, where is the camera? <laughs> and he showed that camera is hanging on his neck. And he told, no, it got discharged. I took it out to take some pictures and it got discharged. And he looked at me and he said, what happened to your, ca- your camera? That is also discharged. I told, yeah. I told, uh, get me your uh, spare camera, the one you have. He told, no, you are carrying two cameras, so I didn't carry mine, additional cameras. And then the next, after next five minutes, we both were sitting in the top of Everest, at the top of the world, like three idiots. So two idiots were sitting there, and we were lamenting that nobody will believe that we have climbed Everest <laughs> because we don't have pictures, we don't have videos. Uh, Nobody is there. And uh, it was getting windy. And I told that, uh, see, at least you have a chance to come next year to prove that you came before. I might not even reach back because I will have to give back my oxygen. And, you know, going without oxygen means it's almost like (laughs) not 50-50. It's like (laughs) 80-20. So then he said, no, 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 let's wait. Let's wait and see if somebody comes. So we were waiting there for a long time. And suddenly we see uh, uh, a group is coming from the china side like so we reached at the top at around 5 30 in the morning so then we see a group coming from the china side tibet side and um, then we were waving at them so they were taking pictures and we were waving and then take our picture take our picture but it was so windy and then suddenly i realized uh, even if they take our pictures uh, now 8848 meter is not a place where you exchange business cards and say okay send the <laughs> picture in this uh, email address or something like that it was a bad idea and then suddenly we saw air uh, drop into my iphone <laughs> <laughs> yeah so the uh, i saw a shaper friend um, the one who denied me the who said that if i if he gives the camera uh, he will die uh, sorry if he gives the um, like you know mask Oxygen. he will die yeah. so i saw him and he was taking pictures in his camera so by that time it became a little warmer and he, his camera is working so we're telling hey take a picture take a picture and he was not listening to us because he was thinking maybe i am asking his oxygen mask now right at this point suddenly that sherpa friend who gave his mask he came and stood in front of us i knew that now there is no way i have to give back my mask now so that is like giving my life away actually now so he was standing in front of me and i didn't even looked at him so I looked at him. I, I saw that he was standing in front of me. I just took off my mask and I just put my extended my arm and gave that mask. I didn't even look at him, like you know. So 10 seconds went off, 20 seconds went off, but he was not taking the mask. I thought, like, why this drama and all? Like, you know, you know, you have to take it, like, you know, so there is no point in doing <laughs> all these things, right? Like, and I was getting a little agitated and I just looked up to him to like with a question in my face uh, that um, take it like you know what is stopping you from taking and suddenly i see that he was wearing my mask and i was so shocked i don't this mask is working i shouted and it was i i was thinking that was i so disillusioned that uh, uh, mask was working and i was thinking it was not working so to that he smiled and he pointed at to the sun so actually it became warmer the whole place became warmer and that blockage actually went off uh, and the mask started working and i suddenly felt that oh I have some more time <laughs> so i'm not dying <laughs> and then we i asked him that okay you sit next to me and uh, you call that sherpa and ask him to take your picture because then 
our picture will also come right so i took that flag india flag and i handed to over to him and he called in nepali and he told him that take take his picture and he just turned and took a picture of him then again i took the manipal flag and told ask him another one <laughs> then he again asked him now when i took out the third flag this guy understood that it was me who was playing this game <laughs> And then he said, no, 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 no more time. Let's go, let's go, let's go. And like, you know, so I went, okay, forget it. Like, at least I have some pictures. Now I told my friend that you stay, uh, but I'm leaving because I know it will be very difficult uh, because I had almost no oxygen, no supplemental oxygen for 30 minutes. So let me uh, leave because anytime anything can happen now. So suddenly I realized that we didn't have a video at the top. And uh, at this moment, uh, uh, my friend suddenly went to Pemba Chiring, like the Sherpa, and he told, hey, Give me your camera and give me a camera. Give me a camera. And then suddenly he snatched the camera and he looked at me and he told, Look at here. And then he put it, take a picture. And then he told, Stand up. And I immediately jumped. <laughs> he took another picture and he tossed that camera to me. Imagine at 8848 meter, he tossing a camera to me and I just caught with all my <laughs> grief, like, Oh my God, he's throwing a camera to me. Then I caught that picture and he don't take my picture and i took two three pictures and the sherpa came and he was so angry he took he snaps the camera and he says, let's go let's go and <laughs> then suddenly i told him that hey and did you take a 360 degree video of the place he told no why i told you haven't taken the video then you will not get a certificate because uh, it requires a 360 degree video and all then he said no that is not the rule i told no this is a new rule and suddenly my friend also told yeah, you don't know this. Oh, then you will not get a certificate. <laughs> the whole intention was that if he takes a 360, then our video will also come in that. Like, you know, the we are also present. And we needed that document proof. And uh, then he was confused and he told how to take a 360 picture video. I told him just take a camera and just turn around and take a whole 360. Video. And then he took and we opened a mask to show our face also that we are the, actually we, because there are a lot of incidents in on Everest where they're impersonating and taking some other's jacket and put a mask and glass and all. So, uh, so then we got that video and now I was happy that even if I die, then at least yeah, there'll be a proof that I had actually come to the top and stuff and all. But much later, this was the funny part. But when I came back, like you know, and that day I lost three of my friends uh, in another expedition. Uh, so they were also on the reverse expedition on the same day. They couldn't go back because their oxygen got over they couldn't reach the uh, camp so we got to know the very next day that this all happened the previous night so we were all very uh saddened to hear this and stuff and all and uh that was a four member team and out of that three member died and one was uh, rescued uh, with a lot of first bites and all so it was very disturbing but uh, when i came back uh, later uh, and reflecting on the whole incident of uh, that oxygen saga i was not comfortable uh because something told me that was i i mean it was abnormal uh, to not get scared or not get panicked at a situation when you're you are in a life and death situation and your oxygen is over so that question kept uh, bugging me that why didn't i panic where i should have been panicked so is there something wrong with me it means it was unnatural right you know it's it should not be like i'm not a saint that um okay no matter take my life i don't care or something like that so it was like you know it's a little difficult to uh, accept that but then when i was reflecting one sudden day i realized uh, something which uh, was very profound i realized that when do we panic we panic when something totally um, new is happening to you and you are not prepared for it and stuffs and all and that day when my oxygen was over uh, the mask was not working. Uh, that was not something my brain perceived as something new was happening. All through my school days and college days, I had this breathlessness situation. I was going through this asthma uh, and it was a daily thing for me. So my subconscious mind didn't think that something new was happening. And that's why I could keep my calm and I could negotiate with my Sherpa. And uh, the same asthma which I was cursing my whole life actually that day saved my life because that kept me uh, keep my mind cool and uh, uh, that kept me sane in the situation where i should have panicked like hell and 
I should have turned back and run around. I mean, I don't know what I should do, but uh, uh, that changed the whole perspective uh, on my asthma. And I don't regret that I had asthma because probably all these years it was preparing me for that day uh, that like, you know, I should be able to handle that situation. So uh, yeah, I mean, like <laughs> that's, uh, that's my story. I mean, story. what do I say? I mean, I had so many questions to ask you, but I feel like I was literally watching a movie. So <laughs> this this is just amazing. And I feel like the audience will also love the story as much as I did. Uh, I just want to end this podcast with three questions. Um, yes. The first one is, you know, the, the whole Everest mountaineering expedition. Uh, how long does it take? I'm, I'm sure it takes multiple days, right? It takes 55 days uh, from Kathmandu to Kathmandu. Yes. Because our uh, human body is not uh, meant to survive at that altitude. So we have to go multiple times up and down to acclimatize. Uh, and then we have to wait for the right weather window to actually go for the final assault. Right. But from the base camp to to the... Base camp. So again, like, you know, so from base camp, uh, you go do a multiple iterations. So you go to camp one, stay one night, then go to camp two, stay one night. The next day, go to a little bit towards camp three and turn back and stay at camp two, then come back base camp. This is one iteration. Second iteration, again, you go directly to camp two without camp one, like, you know, then go to uh, take a rest day, then go to camp three and come back, then take a rest day, then come back to base camp. Then you prepare for the final push. Now, with every iteration, you have to see that whether your performance is increasing or not, because when the first time you will go, you will take a lot of time uh, to reach camp one, a lot of time to reach camp two. Whether you are acclimatized or not, that is an indicator that when you are going for the second time, whether your speed is decreasing or not, whether you are feeling less um, uh, uh, like, you know, fatigue or not. So then you know that you are well acclimatized. Now you go for the final push. Like, you know, so even the final push also will go much faster than your first two attempts. Like, you know, and then you go to the camp three, camp four summit, like, you know, come back. Okay. So, so, so what do you do in the night? Break. Are our nights more scary uh, at that sort of an altitude where... No so we used to hear a lot of water. avalanches around the sound of avalanches initially like we used to get up and run away <laughs> run out from the tents hearing avalanches but then you realize that okay these avalanches uh even if it happens in your camp you cannot run out and save uh, yourselves from there like you know so it's better that and stay in their tent and uh, typically we used to carry uh so most of the time we spend in a camp in the dining area you know, uh, especially in the base camp. And you spend most of the time in the base camp uh, because your climbing days are very less, right? You know, only three times you go up and down and stuff, you know, right? So while we are in base camp, we engage ourselves with uh, playing cards and meeting people, hearing stories. And uh, one thing we ensured that we will never see mountaineering uh, movies. We carried our laptops and all because mountaineering movies are not happy ending movies. Most of the mountaineering movies are like very <laughs> dangerous movies and all. But we used to uh, watch movies like Dil Chata Hai, then Zindagi Na Milegi Dobara and all, all those kind of uh, like, you know, uh, YOLO movies. movies. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, and we used to, the generator used to run for one and a half hours. So we used to see one movie for two days, like, you know, so, <laughs> so that's how we used to spend our time and uh, interact with other teams. Uh, meeting people yeah okay um is k2 on the cards i know it's one of the most toughest mountains to climb uh, i think k2 is uh many people's dream but uh unfortunately with the geography geopolitical situations we can never uh, go to k2 unless there is peace between the two countries of india and pakistan because k2 falls in the pak occupied kashmir and we Indians don't get a visa to go there to climb the mountain. Uh, and especially like, you know, so uh, from India's perspective also, how can you give a visa to a place where you believe that it is yours? Uh, like, you know, so uh, so these are very dicey situations. Uh, so maybe one fine day when all the hatred uh, will be over and when peace will be given a chance, uh, then uh, maybe we will go and climb that mountain. But you're ready for it. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. So it is every mountaineer's dream to attempt uh, K2 at least once in their lifetime. Uh, so yeah. um, I recently yeah, but... listened to a podcast where uh, it had a mountaineer who went to K2 at peak winter. I mean, yes, Nimsday. Oh, yeah. yeah. Nimsday and Nima David. Uh, yeah, yeah. So that they did something unimaginable. Like, you know, people, K2 itself is very tough. And then climbing it in winter, and it was the uh, biggest. Uh, challenge in 
on earth i think and which they made it possible and it is uh, it has encouraged a lot of mountaineers to even try uh, keto in winter in other other years also uh, yeah i think uh, uh, it is uh, very encouraging uh, but uh, for me it doesn't matter uh, whether it's a ketu or it's a parvatmalai uh, as long as i can connect with that mountain and um, every mountain of has its own challenges uh, Uh, especially i would want to uh, talk about malli masthan babu who was the first seven summiter from india um he, he died in a mountain is an yeah. alumnus of my college oh you are from iim calcutta i am from nit jamshedpur okay 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 yeah so uh, he died in a mountain in tres cruces uh, in chile so i actually went there uh, taking his picture and an india flag and uh, the, to the place where he died uh, so i put that his picture there and his uh, the indian flag there and sang a national anthem for him because i think he didn't uh, get the recognition that he should have uh, from our government but uh, it's unfortunate but uh, i think at least that will give him a solace uh, uh, so i couldn't summit that mountain i had to turn back uh, my heart beat went big so also it is very important to know when you should turn back uh, and there are few mountains that i had to turn back uh and i i don't regret again because i think life is more important you can always go back to that mountain but yeah i was happy uh, in my journey um i could get that opportunity to pay a homage to uh, one bright mountaineers uh, mountaineer of india yeah so eventually i climbed the highest volcanoes of all the seven continents and uh, uh it's 2019 till now i still hold that guinness record for being the youngest in the world uh, to climb all these mountains and volcanoes Uh, i also went to the uh, south pole and uh, skiing the last degree skiing and uh, i went to north pole in 2019 uh, but we had to turn back due to geopolitical issues and the next 5 years like till 2023 from 9, 2019 we this expedition is getting cancelled and i think it is also testing my perseverance and uh, uh, like you know endurance <laughs> mental endurance uh, next year again we are going to give it a try a lot of financial uh, um implications for that and a um, um, lot of uh, disappointments but i know that the day i am going to reach to the north pole and finish the grand slam uh, i think that day i will um, appreciate all these uh, uh, like you know sometimes the things which you get very easy you don't appreciate but when it takes a lot many years to uh, reach a place i think uh, that uh, gives me that will give me a lot of um, uh, happiness maybe and uh, just i came back from uh, mount brahma uh, climbing a mountain in indian himalayas in kistwar in jammu near jammu so we climbed this mountain after 43 years uh, and it was the first indian ascent so uh, and this was the total fifth summit in the history of this mountain and uh, we found a new route and we were the first indian also to climb this mountain so yeah i mean like the mountain journey <laughs> uh might not be um, um like you know always uh, very um, uh, like you know out of the country things and stuff so you know, there are a lot of mountains that we have now planned in india as well and uh, even i want to go to different places in africa in uganda uh, venzeri mountains the mountain of the moon and all those places like you know so it need not to be the highest or uh, deadliest or anything est <laughs> but i think uh, <laughs> it's about the exploration um, and trying to get a different flavor from different different uh, parts of the world and uh, it's not about just mountaineering alone you also get to know their culture the, you have to get meet new people your horizon uh, increases and uh, uh, with all this uh, accumulation of uh, experiences i hope that i can use it to motivate other people in their own uh, journey of mountain climbing of their life like you know so uh, that's my aspiration and oh, uh, great i hope this uh, talk helps a lot of people yeah. to pursue their own dreams i just want yeah. to end this talk with one question i think that's probably the most appropriate question when you climbed mount everest at at that peak summit how was the view like i know it's very very difficult to explain in words what you saw but was it worth it, was, it or like no nah, it was magical and um, i think more than the external view it is about you perceiving uh, something which you thought you never can do and you achieve it uh, and then it's more than the view are, yeah it's more than the view 
because view you can always see a much better view in a 4k resolution in tv <laughs> and vr and stuff and all yes obviously that view is uh, unparalleled no doubt but it's about like you are looking at something but actually in your vision you see a lot of people's faces moving out like your parents your people who stood by you people who didn't stood by you you thank everyone like you know it's a very emotional moment when you stand in the top of uh, of that world and uh, you know that uh, coming here so many people uh, gave up their life so many people still aspires to come to that place and you are there where uh, great people like Mallory um, uh, wanted to come there you uh, Tenzing and Everest became Tenzing and Everest after coming here like you know and then you are also following their footsteps and it, it is a totally different uh, thing and also that the big big mountains which you see from the base camp uh, when you see from the top you see them them as Lilliput mountains there like you know it's just like the problems in our life so when you look at the problem uh, from uh, far you see that there are big big problems but actually when you go through them and you overcome them them and when you look back it's just like those Lilliput mountains I think and it's a beautiful view it and it's, it really feels like being at the top of the world feeling oh, that's awesome uh, on that note I think we should we should end this podcast Thank you so much. Thank you so, so much for giving me your time. Uh, I'm I'm 100% sure that the, the listeners will also enjoy this conversation. Uh, thank you so much. Well, that was probably the most inspiring and exciting and thrilling story that I've ever heard live. Uh, I hope you guys enjoyed it. I'll be back with another guest next time. Till then, peace.